Two and a Half Admins, episode 39. I'm Joe. I'm Jim. And I'm Alan. And here we are again. And you want to plug another blog post for a change, Alan. This one is the basics of ZFS snapshot management. Yes. Uh, So it covers mostly the basics, getting into a little bit of the advanced stuff, but not too much, of what you can do with ZFS snapshots and how to create and destroy them and manage them. And will eventually lead into more in-depth articles where we get into things like uh, snap spec to specify ranges of snapshots uh, and using holds to prevent snapshots from being destroyed and so on. I feel like we should just plug the RSS feed for your blog. Maybe we should put that in the notes as well then. Maybe, yeah. Let's do some feedback then. And the first one is from Tybalt, I think you say that. Uh, You recently talked about ZFS snapshots and replication tools. I wonder if any of you have ever used ZREPL for that. ZRipple is a tool written in Go that makes it easy to take a snapshot, replicate it on another server, and manage different pruning policies for the snapshot. It can use different transport layers, TCP, TLS, and even directly with SSH. And then he links to the GitHub for that. So, uh, yeah, this is like a modern version of Sanoid by the sounds of things. Excuse me? (laughs) You've written in a modern language, go. So I know the kid that wrote this, and it's a pretty good thing. It was designed specifically, I think, for backing up his laptop ZFS file system to his home server or whatever. I don't know that it's a replacement, but it's a a kind of alternative to Jim's stuff. Although I, I don't know that it does the snapshot management part that much. It doesn't. Uh, ZREPL is is basically a uh, a sync away to alternative. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not really intended to do everything that Sanoid does, but the just the replication part. I haven't used it because I built Syncoid first, and it's awesome. So I just really didn't particularly have a need to go you know browsing everybody else's replication tool. Kind of a similar story for me. I I didn't write it, but I inherited maintainership of ZXFer, and it works for what I needed. And I've not bothered with the other tool, but I know lots of people use ZREPL and that uh, the developer is pretty active in OpenZFS. And uh, I've recommended the tool to other people when they've asked for something that was less shell scripty than ZXFer. My first replication tool, I named ZXFer, but uh, I, uh, I ended up rewriting it from scratch. And what I did, I changed the name because I had to name Sanoid. And once I'd done that, it just, the value of having a similar OID name was obvious. When I was going to rewrite one from scratch. I bought a .sh domain name for it and everything. And then after three years of renewing it, I gave up because <laughs> I had never, never started on writing the tool. <laughs> but I'm, I'm saving the name. Just I'm not going to say it because somebody will use it up. Brandon says, I have a home server and cloud server that I host some general things on, like Nextcloud and websites. Recently, you guys had talked about using basic HTTP auth as a level of security and protection on the reverse proxy for things that one might need to host, but might be too complicated to get everyone who needs access set up on WireGuard for. What are your thoughts on Authelia serving that function? I've been following the Linux server IO folks and have been considering implementing their swag container with Authelia and 2FA. Curious about your thoughts on that as it pertains to security. It seems like it could be pretty, and more secure than directly exposing Nextcloud, etc., and has the bonus of being able to do SSO for the underlying services if supported. Yeah, I don't have any experience with Athelia, but yeah, exactly. If it has the integration with Nextcloud, that maybe helps. Although, if it doesn't have the brute force protection, then if Nextcloud is going to use Athelia anyway, then there maybe isn't a point of putting the nginx proxy in front of it because if athelia is brute forcible then it's going to not provide any protection but i assume that it being a single sign-on thing it already has some brute force protection it bans an account after too many attempts which i don't love because that makes it easy for anybody who knows your username to just you know get that banned it seems somewhat interesting using the same password for that http basic in front as you use for the next cloud can make sense especially when you need to protect some things that need the HTTP basic protection and some that don't. So no specific experience with Athelia, but yeah, using single sign-on in that case uh, does seem to make sense just because you're avoiding having to manage a bunch of extra usernames and passwords. But you do want to watch out for both that A, it provides protection against brute force attacks, and B, that in doing so, it doesn't make it easy for someone to lock you out of your own machine. 
and see that you understand not only how to install Authelia, but how to update Authelia as it needs it and that you'll be aware of when it needs updating. That'd be my biggest concern. Because if somebody breaks Apache, you know, HTTP basic authentication, that is going to be enormous news. And the next time the uh, unattended upgrades cron job fires off, it's going to automatically upgrade my Apache and fix that for me. Whereas I don't have anything like that going on with Ophelia. And I I wasn't actually familiar with it until uh, Brendan asked his question. It looks good. I like the fact that it's a project whose entire raison d'etre is authentication. So in theory, it should take it quite seriously. But um, I just don't feel like it's well known and understood enough for me to blindly trust it yet. Okay, this episode is sponsored by CBT Nuggets, training for IT professionals or anyone looking to build IT skills. Go to cbtnuggets.com slash two five admins and sign up for a seven day free trial. The on-demand virtual labs mean you can build practical experience with the commands, config, scripts, and everything you need to get the most out of each course. Another standout feature is the accountability coaching service, available to all learners with a subscription, which gives you access to a real person who will help you craft a personalized learning plan and set goals, and will check in with you to keep you accountable. So start your free seven-day trial today at cbtnuggets.com slash 25admins. It includes unlimited access to all course materials, including virtual labs. That's cbtnuggets.com slash 25admins. Okay, Chris says, I wonder if you have considered starting a subreddit or Discord or something related to the show. It might be nice for your listeners to submit suggestions about topics and opinions. What do we think about this? Think I'm creating a subreddit right fucking now. I don't spend a lot of time on Reddit. Uh, like, I think for questions, I'd prefer everything continue to come in via email. But if, as a community, our listeners want to help each other and, and maybe suggest stuff for us to cover on the show, I, that seems like an okay idea to me. The thing is, with email, right, if it all comes in to one address, I can just search that in Gmail. And when I'm preparing the show, I go through it and put, everything in the relevant docs that I need for, you know, questions on ZFS and all the rest of it, it's just easier to do. And if it's all centralized in email, it's just easier for me. And, you know, that you guys see those emails as well and sometimes reply to them directly or whatever. Whereas fragmenting it all, I mean, yes, it does mean that people can talk to each other, but the thing about email is like, you can go for completely managed sign up for a free Gmail account, or you could roll your own email server on a Raspberry Pi in a cupboard somewhere if you were brave enough. You know, it's a completely open protocol. That's why I'm attracted to it, because everyone has email, right? Whereas if you go for Reddit or Discord, then some people are not going to be into that. Well, Reddit at least is just a website. It's not an app like Discord. But... Yeah, I mean, Discord you can use in the browser, but I just, right. I don't think I'm going to participate in Discord, quite frankly. And Reddit, I just have this pathological hatred of Reddit. I don't mind Reddit, just when I go there, I tend to very quickly be like, yeah, if I don't get out of here, I'm going to spend too much time here and I don't have time right now. <laughs> but Jim, you're like really into Reddit, right? I don't know if I go that far. I mean... You're like, yeah, I'm setting up a Reddit right now. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, I'm, I'm into it in the sense that, you know, I literally mod RZFS. There have been points in time that I was more into Reddit as a whole. Um, as it is right now, the only thing I pay any attention to is, is ZFS. Like I used to be real active on Arsys admin and a bunch of other places, but uh, now really the only place I'm active is RZFS, although every once in a while, if I wrote an article that I'm really interested in seeing people's feedback on, like I'll go trawling on Reddit to see, you know, who posted that article where. Right. Like I used to be on, was it server fault, the stack overflow for sysadmins. I used to answer a lot of questions there, but I just have not had time in years. <laughs> You can't have a dot in your subreddit name, though. So what are we going to call it if we do do it? Two five admins. It's already done. <laughs> All right. Get you. I mean, it, it could certainly be tidied up more. Like, uh, you know, it's, it's very bare bones, but it exists. Because like once you said it, I was like, if nothing else, you just need to block out the damn namespace. Yeah. All right. Well, it's there. If you want to go use it, then I don't know. I might try and check it once in a while. But yeah, email is the, still the primary means of communicating with us please it's just so much easier yeah all the questions coming in the same way just is the only way we're going to see them <laughs> yeah all right 
Chris goes on to say this, something that was echoed by quite a few people. Just thought I would send in an opinion on a recent question about Docker, ZFS, and backups. I don't believe Docker is designed for you to back up individual volumes or selectively back up part of the Docker data. I think the assumption is that you're going to back up the entire system or back up data from your services using some application methods outside of Docker. I think there are two common options. Either use bind mounts to mount some path from outside of your container, or if you really want to use volumes, then you can use some kind of tool like VACUP or some application level backup tools to export the data out of the containers into some external system or path on the file system that has standard snapshots and replication, etc. Bind mounts is, is what I was suggesting. I just didn't know the Linux term for it. Yeah, and there was other people as well. Daniel and Hank talked about that. Hank also said, do I recall a question about why we had mapping or similar for control S and perhaps control Q? I'm pretty sure Alan commented that he didn't know why they were there. You guys make me feel old. These were used in the ancient days to control output and are still supported today. If you've got a long listing that scrolls off the screen, hit Control S and it will pause and Control Q will resume. Of course, this was easier to use in the days of the 300 board modem. I suspect that sometimes people occasionally hit Control S by mistake in an X term and then think their session is locked up. Just hit Control Q and move along. These characters are also known as Xon and Xoff, and you can learn more by searching Xon Xoff flow control. Discussions of byte stuffing are left for another day. Clearly, Hank is uh, a real grey beard. I don't remember having a question about Control S, but there's lots of things I don't remember. Yeah, I don't remember that either. I do remember the 300 baud modem days, though, and 110 baud at that. I don't. My first modem was 9600 baud. <laughs> but I didn't know about Control S and Control Q. I must admit. I'm not sure those were applicable in my, you know, 110 and then 300 baud modem days because it was usually, uh, you know, weird bitty boxes, not Unix machines, like trash 80 model two business machines, you know, that kind of thing. And teletypes, actual teletypes. We got quite a lot of feedback about uh, getting qualifications and getting into the industry. Gavin said, I agree with Alan and Jim that the best way to begin with formal qualifications would be via the trade or community school diploma and maybe picking an industry certification or two along the way. Something that I'm noticing recently is that my industry colleagues are surprised that I still do sysadmin stuff and wonder why I haven't gone into a specialization where all the big money is. My answer is there still needs to be people who know how everything on a system works in concert with everything else. Sysadmining is a general skills technology specialist. I think it's important for people to realize that just because cloud is the new big thing, traditional sysadmin work is not going away anytime soon. You don't really hear about it that much, but it turns out the machines the cloud runs on need to be sysadmined. Yes, they do. And part of the answer that I haven't gone for a specialization where quote unquote all the big money is, is it wouldn't increase my income any. I mean, if you're a good sysadmin, you can absolutely make as much money as, you know, you can being a, I don't know, a Kubernetes person or, you know, whatever. Yeah, I've, I've not felt the need to chase anything. I've gone where I've been interested because that has more value to me than getting paid more. And generally, I'm good enough at it that I can get paid more for it without having to do something I don't like. Is a reasonable analogy doctors? You've got your general practitioner, your family doctor or whatever, who has a, a good understanding or a reasonable understanding of everything, but then refers you if you need a specialist. And, you know, same with you guys. If there was someone coming to you who needed specifically Kubernetes or whatever, you would refer them to someone who knows just about that. I think probably a, a better medical analogy would be a general purpose vet versus like a horse vet. Right. And, you know, I don't necessarily see myself as just the general purpose guy. Like, I have quite a specialization in ZFS and storage, but not exclusively. Okay, this episode is sponsored by Linode. Go to linode.com slash two and a half to get started with $100 free credit and 60 days to use it. Linode offers cloud computing solutions in data centers all over the world. Whether it's scalable VMs with a choice of major distros or one-click apps and stacks, dedicated CPU and high RAM instances, block and object storage, or cloud firewalls and DDoS protection, Linode has everything you need for your personal projects right up to managed enterprise infrastructure. I recently moved my website over to Linode and it was really straightforward. 
And when I needed a mumble server for our late night Linux community meetups, spinning up a new VM for that was an absolute breeze. Everything's been running flawlessly since I set it up, and I love the peace of mind I get from the automatic backups. So go to linode.com slash two and a half, get your $100 credit, and check out Linode's great cloud hosting services and first class always available support. That's linode.com slash two and a half. All right, let's talk about a post that you found, Alan, about poor disk performance and dust on the platters. Yes. So uh, this is from uh, Brendan Gregg, uh, who wrote the Dtrace book and the BPF performance tools book and the systems performance book and invented flame graphs and lots of other stuff. Uh, but maybe most famous for his video of screaming at hard drives. Yes. Has everyone seen this? It's linked in the article further down. But he actually was able to show using uh, Sun's old monitoring tool, was able to show that when he went up to the front of the server in the rack and just screamed at the hard drives, uh, the latency went up by a significant amount on those hard drives that he yelled at. Uh, and that hard drives don't like being yelled at or whatever. And so in this case, Brendan recently moved back to Australia from the US. And in doing so, while moving, he found an old 80 gigabyte SATA hard drive laying around with the top taken off because it had needed some work or something at some point. And he saw the dust on the platter and thought back to uh, his days in school where he learned about the gap in a hard drive. So, uh, you know, hard drives are this series of metal platters with the armature in the head reading the data off the disk. Our listeners can't see your hand gestures, Alan. <laughs> I know. Anyway, the gap between the, the head uh, that does the reading and the platter is very small. But, you know, when someone says it's five nanometers, you're like, yes, I understand that's small. But how small is that? And so when you look at a diagram and look at a speck of dust... And it turns out that that particle of dust is a thousand times bigger than that five nanometer gap of air between the head and the platter. It leads to some questions like what's going to happen when the arm on that hard drive goes snapping over to a spot while that disk that's got that speck of dust on it is spinning at 7200 RPM and that mote of dust slams into that head. What's going to happen? <laughs> This is an excellent analogy for interstellar travel. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> anyway, what he actually gets into in here is using the tools uh, built into your operating system like IOSTAT to see what's going wrong with a hard drive. So he starts out with just an IOSTAT-XZ and looking at it and seeing that the average read wait time on this hard drive was over 400 milliseconds, but that the queue size was an less than two meaning that there wasn't a lot of work queued up for this hard drive to do, but each one was taking a really long time, which suggests it's not that the hard drive is busy, it's that the hard drive isn't working well. You don't want to see dial-up levels of latency on your hard drive, folks. But he found some really interesting things, like when he put the lid back on the hard drive, it worked slightly better. But if he held the lid down, it worked even better. And it turns out that vibration affects hard drives, as you might have known. And so it leads to this crazy picture of the hard drive with a two liter thing of apple juice sitting on top of it to try to hold the lid down and quelch some of the vibrations so that the hard drive will read faster. I wonder if the fluid in the bottle actually did a better job than a solid weight would have. That's a good question. <laughs> I didn't even think of that. Uh, but he goes on to show the IOSTAT with the different amounts of, of pressure on the drive and watching the latency change. But he also goes in to talk about how sometimes those numbers output by IOSTAT, because they are averages, don't actually tell you the whole story. For example, if you actually do have queued up commands and say each IO you're doing on this hard drive is going to take 10 milliseconds because it takes 8 milliseconds to seek, uh, or for the, the spot on the drive to come all the way around, and then a little bit to do the work. So if it's going to take 10 milliseconds for each read, if you queue up five reads that are in different places on the hard drive, they're actually going to show up in the uh, BioSnoop tool as taking 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50 milliseconds of latency. Because, you know, the disk can only do one of those at a time. And it's because of the queue, they're going to have taken this different amount of time but how you can look at other fields in the BioSnoop output to see that, oh, they were each happening 10 seconds apart, so that's what that latency was. Uh, you know, the latency between when we issued the command and when it got done isn't necessarily the latency it takes of the drive actually executing that one command. 
and he gets into that, but he also uh, ends up using the bio latency tool to do something like Dtrace's uh, histograms to look at the latency of some of these. So for example, he found that when he was pressing down on the hard drive with his weight to suppress the vibrations, a normal 128K read with DD took about 1.6 to 2 milliseconds. So it took about 2 milliseconds to read a sector. But if the disk had trouble and had to retry the read, because the revolution time for the 7200 RPM hard drive was about 8 milliseconds, you would see reads that took a second attempt to succeed would take about 10 milliseconds. And ones that took three attempts would take 16 milliseconds or 18 milliseconds. And then if it took four attempts, it would be about 25 to 30 milliseconds. And if you just look at the IOSTAT average and you see, you know, an average latency of 5.1 milliseconds, that doesn't actually tell you that compared to the histogram where you see like about 100 of the 250 requests completed in one second, but, you know, something like another 10% of those took two tries and a much larger percentage of them took somewhere between three and five tries to get right. So looking at just the average doesn't always tell you what's happening. And that's why having the distribution looking at how frequently it took one second versus how frequently it took 16 seconds or milliseconds uh, can actually give you a lot more information. A couple of things probably worth pointing out here. One is that um, the idea that you're not always going to see the problems because it it might get it might get hidden in an, in an average. That's not usually going to be the case with hard drive issues because there is usually such a massive difference between a good result and a bad result that if you're looking at the mean of all scores, if you've got 500 operations that complete in a millisecond and you've got one that took, you know, five full seconds to complete, that's going to be enough to bump that mean up to, to where you can see there's a problem. Um, another thing to point out is that um, you can, without having to get quite as high tech as Brendan does, uh, you know, with, with the BCC tool, you can totally get a distribution if you're using an active disk test tool like FIO. FIO will already give you a distribution so you can see, you know, percentile results. But what's neat about Brendan's approach is he can use that to model how the drives are responding to whatever the actual organic workload of the system is. Whereas with FIO, you have to figure out how to relatively accurately model your workload, and then you can see, you know, what the response to that is when FIO models that workload, whereas Brennan's just looking at what happens when my disk does the thing my disk is doing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. FIO is you generally, you know, when you're doing a random read or whatever, it's the worst possible case. It's completely random, so no prefetching is going to help, and you're saying... In the worst possible random read case, we see that 90% of the time the latency is less than 5 milliseconds, and so it's good. And you know that in a real-world workload, which may be going to be slightly better than the worst possible case, you know your performance is going to be at least that good, or should be anyway. Uh, and like you're saying, yes, using BCC or Dtrace or whatever to actually look at what's happening on your system can help you learn more about what's actually going on in this case. Because what he also talked about was uh, it was weird when you're holding down the hard drive, actually feeling the hard drive stepping up through its gears of like, okay, at this speed, things are still working. So I'm going to increase my speed again. And it keeps doing that in steps, kind of ratcheting it up until it gets starts seeing ECC errors. And then it's like, right, I'm going to go back one speed slower. And that's how good this hard drive can work right now. It's the tactile version of like, you know, the old school 1990s listening to the modem handshake. Yeah. It used to drive me nuts when people would turn off the speaker on the modem. So I'm like, no, 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 I want to hear the handshake going so exactly. I know if things are going well or not. <laughs> I remember being able to tell if I was going to get all 33.6 or if I was going to get something slower because of that. Or, you know, the, the difference between like 52 and 56K. Now, the other thing that I would like to point out here that um, lots of Brendan's work really makes clear, I get a lot of pushback from people on the topic of whether you know, you, you buy good drives for storage or not, or whether you get just the cheapest thing you can find. And I hear a lot of skepticism about, you know, claims from manufacturers that, uh, you know, they've got improved bearings in their NAS grade drives, uh, you know, that minimize vibration and that that's important for packing a bunch of hard drives, you know, into a single chassis. And I think Brendan's work really goes a long way towards demonstrating that, yes, this is really a thing. I mean, it seems fairly obvious when you see this dude literally just go, Ah, 
into a rack full of hard drives and their latency all goes to crap. Well, you can see that vibration is really an issue and that, yeah, if you're going to pack, you know, 8, 10, 20, 40 drives into a chassis, you definitely do want drives that are built for that. Yeah, uh, that was another thing I was going to bring up is like, we see that often with like the desktop drives is like, this isn't for RAID or whatever. And then like, they have like the cheap NAS drives is like, this is only good up to 12 or 16 drives. And then you should buy the more expensive pro version. Uh, and it turns out not necessarily purely marketing wank. Uh, a lot of times it is down to, you know, we put more parts and more firmware into that drive to make a deal with those vibrations and maybe not have to spin slower and be worse performing just because of the the amount of vibration in the thing. Because, you know, you think about how much is in the chassis and then you realize, well, if I fill a rack with these, it turns out each chassis is not going to be completely isolated either. They're usually not isolated at all. <laughs> exactly. It's just metal on metal. And then yeah, your usual rack, everything is not only bolted together, but just gorilla gronked every possible screw. So you've created, you know, one giant vibrating pillar of doom. One thing that I learned from this was that how the head moves across the platter is by floating on a thin film of air that almost like lubricates it. And I didn't know that. I'd never really thought about it. But it means that if you're at a seriously high altitude, the air is too thin and drives start to fail. That reminded me of the thing I saw earlier in the week, which is uh, on Dell's website, they have a, a disclaimer telling you that if you run a hard drive at an altitude higher than 10,000 feet, uh, it voids the warranty. <laughs> it's like, yeah, we, we're not going to replace the drive when it dies because of that. Although... Uh, in the talk here, it says that, you know, above 7,000 feet in the, in is probably enough of a problem. And there's actually an anecdote at the in the comments at the bottom of somebody uh, who worked in South America and had people come in with their uh, iPods, the old hard drive based iPods, where the head would crash when they took it hiking up the mountain. Because when the air got thin enough and, you know, you're jostling it around as you're carrying this thing and it would end up just the head would crash and just gouge the hard drive and, and your iPod was toast. Now, the interesting question to me is whether this also holds true for the newer helium drives. I was thinking the same thing because the helium drives are usually sealed rather than having that air filter because you need the helium not to get out. Yeah, I mean, they're not usually sealed. They are sealed or they're not helium drives. <laughs> exactly. And so... I've never actually looked to see if they if the manufacturers actually change the guidance about what altitudes they can operate at on the helium hard drives. I think that falls under the category of why would they change the guidance? You know, they're just like, no, we give you no guarantees if you want to run this stuff at 10,000 feet of altitude, you madman. Or specifically, if you want a hard drive that works at 10,000 feet, here's our special ruggedized hard drive. It costs four times as much. Ah, uh, that's what must be on planes then, storing all the movies and stuff. Or are they all SSDs these days? Well, no, because the cabin is pressurized to like 6,000 feet, right? Oh, yeah, I guess so. That's why your, hard drive, your laptop doesn't die while you use it on an airplane. Yeah, true, true. It might actually be 8,000 feet on the crappier airplanes. Surely not that high. 8,000? Anything under 10,000, you don't need to pressurize the cabin, right? Like when a, when a plane loses cabin pressure, they will dive to 10,000 feet and stay there. So I think normally the cabin is pressurized for about 8,000 feet. And th on things like the Dreamliner, I think it's 6,000 feet. And that's why it feels nicer. Airbus planes are typically pressurized to uh, an altitude of 6,128 feet. Okay. And Boeing is typically about 5,100 feet. Okay. And even at that relatively high pressure, the food still tastes like shit. Yeah. On the plus side, though, you're not smelling the just cacophony of farts going on <laughs> yeah. from all directions on a plane. Yeah. Because you know, nobody talks about this, but when you go up and, you know, now you're you're suddenly at, you know, 6,000 feet altitude effectively. Uh, well, guess what? Just expanded. You're, yep. Everybody's <laughs> farting. It's not just you. <laughs> anyway, it was a great post for uh, Brendan and it really goes hand in hand with his screaming at the hard drives video because now he's like holding the hard drive to try to to reduce the vibrations and finding that it meant that he could recover the data off his 80 terabyte SATA drive over USB a lot faster. Although I think the best part of the story is that he had a hard drive that he had taken the lid off at some point, didn't remember what was on it, and bothered to pack it and move it all the way to Australia with him. Yeah, that's, that's a little odd. No, the best part is that there was only one eight kilobyte sector that couldn't be read and otherwise he could read the whole thing, but it doesn't say what was on it. So presumably just hilarious memes or something. Filth. 
it's an 80 gigabyte hard drive that's like SATA one or whatever. I, it might be too old for memes. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, we'd better get out of here then. Remember show at 2.5admins.com if you want to send in your questions or feedback. You can find me on Twitter at Joe Rissington. I'm at JRSSNet. And I'm at Alan Jude. We'll see you next week.